Well, welcome back, everybody. How very good to have you with us again. And if you missed anything from this morning, don't worry. It's all going to be available on demand just a little bit later after the uh, event. So what do we do this morning? Well, we looked at the potential for restorative approaches after harm has occurred. Um, we found how this institute have been applying principles of co-design to develop a maternity safety improvement program. And we had two great presentations from uh, this institute fellows. And uh, we, I think what we've really come away with is that improving healthcare requires taking a broad approach. And that means um, issues as diverse as ethics, inclusion and co-design have to be part of the process. Now, uh, oh, I've got one herogram that's arrived, which I have to tell you about uh, because I was just so pleased uh, to see it. And Louise Lowcock, I think I'm, you know who you are. Um, she's sent a fantastic um, uh, comment and it said, um, this space is a great example of how rewarding an online conference can be. Louise Locott, we absolutely agree with you. This has been uh, fantastic. And this morning just flew by. Well, we've got a great afternoon session coming up for you. And the first person that I want to welcome is Rohin Francis. Now, he's a full-time NHS cardiologist and comedian. Uh, the punctuation had gone slightly awry here. You don't have to be a comedian to be an NHS cardiologist. He is a, a comedian as well as being an NHS cardiologist. And he's a YouTube creator. His uh, MedLife Crisis uh, program has over 500,000 uh, followers. And he's also very active on Twitter. I would say that he had 40,000 Twitter followers, but actually given what has been going on recently, he may have had a big drop off unexplained in followers. Uh, apparently it's all bots for, for all of us. Now, what Rohin Francis, uh, Francis has been asked to look at is why the Silicon Valley approach to medicine doesn't easily translate to healthcare. And he's going to look particularly at things like novelty bias, why there's so much reluctance to evaluate, and he'll challenge the perception that new is always better. Hooray is what I say, and how timely all of this is. What were the news of Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes uh, getting a substantial prison uh, uh, sentence? And actually what was exposed during all of that is that this fake it until you make it approach of those who want to uh, break things and disrupt and make uh, give a really sort of uh, impassioned plea that actually breaking things and disrupting is always a good thing. So Rohin, we're fascinated to, to know what you say and do please comment in the chat boxes. Rohin, over to you. Hi everybody, um, my name is Rohin. I'm, as you've probably just heard, uh, a full-time NHS cardiologist and I'm uh, very honoured and, and privileged to be kicking things off with this talk at uh, this particular conference especially, which I'll explain why in a second, but um, the the whole point of, of this conference and um, something that I'm sure you're all interested in is making medicine safer, more effective and better. And technology has obviously been a huge tool in doing that through the, um, the through history. And I am someone who's very dependent on technology in my in my specialty. In particular, we're, we're very dependent on imaging techniques and all the kind of devices that are put inside a patient. They're all products of technology created by engineers and coders and, and things like that. And I'm a big fan of tech in my personal life as well. So I want to sort of start my, my talk by saying that I'm very much in favor of what technology can offer. Um, but 
I've done a bit of consulting with um, AI companies, with um, wearables companies, and a mindset that I sometimes encounter, not only from people in those fields, but even from clinicians as well, is something that I tend to refer to as Silicon Valley medicine or Silicon Valley thinking, which I'll go into in this talk. But I think if we had to try and summarize a few key um uh, headlines or sort of features of this this particular mindset. It's the belief that the human body is essentially just a computer, that we're a machine. And like any computer, we've got a source code, which is DNA. And DNA is just basically a, a very complex string of code. And like any code in any computer, if you figure it out, you can hack it. And this is a term that we hear very commonly in these kinds of uh, biotech fields that we can we can hack the human body and we can solve all the problems that ail us if we can just uh, use a sophisticated enough algorithm to understand it. We can detect problems before they arise because we can predict the future with um, reliability by understanding this source code. And we can then tailor treatments in a very precision, personalized way. And healthcare is a stuffy Luddite industry in desperate need of disruption. And, you know, this is a field that I've kind of um, followed closely for, for quite a long time. And as I said, you know, I've had some interactions with people from a coding, maths, physics, engineering kind of background or people who are from a business background. A lot of the investors, uh, VC kind of biotech investors, you know, you can understand a lot of them speaking in this language. But I also encounter quite a few clinicians um, who, who think this way. So I, you know, looked uh, in, in preparation for this talk at a article, the top 10 biotech uh, companies to watch. And I just plugged in the blurb from each one into a kind of word cloud. And these are the kinds of terms that come up again and again. You know, they often sound almost interchangeable that they're going to offer um, precision, personalized medicine using DNA and chromosome and genomics and all, all these kinds of buzzwords. Um, so is this too good to be true uh, or should we all be investing? The two areas that um, we are told are kind of central to this revolution are processing power and data. And processing power, as uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard of something called Moore's Law, which is essentially a kind of rule of thumb. But it, it's, it describes the fact that our uh, computing processing power has increased at breakneck speeds over recent decades. It may be slowing a bit, but it's still on the up. So our computers are getting more powerful. That's definitely true. But data is perhaps more recently become almost something of a religion. And um, you can understand to an extent that um, all our tech overlords at the moment, Amazon, Google, Facebook, have built and they've become so omnipotent based on reams and reams of data. And you can see, you know, this is just a, a, a graphic sort of demonstrating data growth has been exponential. So people use this mindset to uh, apply to, to the human body as well. And if we are considering the human body to be a machine, then uh, the more data we can gather, the, the, more, the better we'll understand it. And there's a case study, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, which I won't spend too much time on um, the details because there are TV programs and books which are fantastic and I'd recommend, but it's Theranos, of course. So Theranos was this biotech unicorn. This is a term given to these kind of startups which get billion plus valuations. And uh, I, I just mentioned Theranos without going into all the details again, because I think it is a really instructive example of this kind of belief. Well, I mean, there's a more um, recent one with, with all the stuff going on, the kind of slow motion car crash of Elon Musk taking over Twitter, I think, is another demonstration of that mindset of that this sort of belief that um, that tech, this faith in tech being able to solve so many problems. We all remember Elon Musk's suggestion for the Thai cave rescue, but certainly his and, and during the pandemic as well, he, he uh, started telling doctors on, on Twitter how to use a ventilator because, you know, he'd figured it out. Um, but Theranos, uh, is is a great example because there are, I think, three take-home messages, which I hope we've learned from. I don't know if we actually have, but a lot of these biotech unicorns are 
um, defined by what we call stealth research. So this is, they make all these claims and they'll they'll put in their press release that they have done X, Y, Z, but actually their published data is nowhere to be found. And this is often um, excused because these are proprietary things. These are their patents and, you know, they're coming from a business perspective, so they can't just give away their secrets. But of course, we've got no way of verifying their claims. And so the time-honored tradition of science of publishing your methods and your findings, they're not doing. So this is stealth research. We just have to kind of take their word for it. People want to believe in a fairy tale. You know, a lot of the the motivation for for this biotech stuff is is really emotive stuff and um you know we we're trying to save people's lives we're trying to improve people's lives so people want to believe in in fairy tales in elizabeth holmes case she was this kind of steve jobs character that was kind of revolutionizing um disrupting healthcare and there's this techno optimism which uh, sometimes is referred to as automation bias this this faith in technology now this uh, study here is actually from 2011. So it's more than a decade ago. And you can see that um, even back then, when we didn't have all the sophisticated AI and machine learning that we have today, we still had this term for automation bias. And you can think, um, uh, those of you familiar with the ECG heart tracing machines, they have this automated readout at the top. And there are so many occasions where somebody will look at an ECG and think, well, it looks normal and the patient seems fine, but the, the ECG machine is telling me that they're having a heart attack. So I better do something about it. And that's the most basic decision tree on those machines. So as our algorithms get more and more sophisticated, this, this deference to tech seems to only be getting worse. And the promise um, central to a lot of this thinking is um, something referred to as precision medicine. And this is uh, Barack Obama uh, announcing the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative in 2015, but actually it goes back way further. I found papers uh, uh, in the early 19th century talking about the dichotomy between applying data gathered from a population to a specific individual patient sitting in front of you with all their idiosyncrasies and individuality. And that is, you know, a genuine real problem that we're still dealing with 200 years later. So the intention is very good, but this idea that we can tailor all our treatments to a specific patient is nothing new. In fact, it's been talked about for a long time. And even before 2015, here is a video from uh, our our host Vivian Parry uh, back well there's no date of of um, of the event but it was uploaded 14 years ago to YouTube it was a, a an event talking about personalizing cancer treatment um, so I just found that quite interesting that um, you know we're still having the same conversations and those of you of my vintage or or, or older will remember all the hype and the excitement around the Human Genome Project in the uh, sort of late 90s and early noughts. And um, this was, you know, people would talk about it as the blueprint to the human race, that we would have all of this information we could unlock as soon as we understood the human genome. And um, there were some early um, successes. There were some um, early uh, very powerful stories that came out of patients with um, genetic diseases, which are caused maybe by a single point mutation. So a single amino acid is changed or a protein is altered very slightly. And a lot of these patients had eluded diagnosis up till then. So this was really life changing for them. Some even got some therapeutic options, which they didn't have before. And these were you know, genuine successes. And th these are these are true success stories. So it's totally understandable that there was hype. But these represent a tiny percentage of the overall disease burden. The majority of the diseases that affect millions of people, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, all these kinds of things, they're not caused by a single simple point mutation in, in DNA. In fact, we, we're still trying to figure out how they relate to genes. There is no gene for heart disease or gene for cancer in the majority of cases. So this is to think that just the source code, the DNA, can predict all this stuff about the future is to wildly overestimate the importance of DNA or underestimate the importance of all the other factors that go into the equation. And so 
over the, the subsequent years, the business model, and obviously there is a lot of money in this, um, and, and a lot of that's often the motivation changed from trying to um, identify uh, problems with with patients who've got pre existing issues to trying to predict the future and opening up the potential customer base from patients with medical conditions to the 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 whole population healthy people and this started a trend of kind of using technology to start medicalizing normal life and it, it's led to in recent years the development of a lot of uh, companies i'm sure you've heard of these dna testing companies and there are two kind of um, examples of of the Silicon Valley thinking that I want to highlight today. This is this is the first one, which is all this DNA testing, and people are just voluntarily giving their DNA to these private companies because they are being told that they're they're going to get some really useful health information. Um, so Twenty Three and Me, you've of course uh, probably heard of, um, which is one of the biggest, and they've kind of dialed back on some of their health claims. But there are companies like uh, Origen, and I'm not making this stuff up. This is directly from their website. They've got a beauty DNA test, which I quote, can tell you if you have oily or dry skin or whether you should stay out of the sun. Um, the, this is information you can only get from testing your DNA. They also have a vitamin DNA test. And instead of doing a 50p blood test to see if you're deficient in a certain vitamin, no, nope, they're saying that they need to test your DNA to tell you if potentially you might be deficient in vitamins. Um, you know, this is really uh, important stuff. There are some which are a bit more respectable. This is from the Mayo Clinic, which has more modest claims. Companies, you can see some of their marketing is, is very kind of sexy uh, packaging it looks really good this viome has this precision uh, offer that uh, these little supplements which of course you know have have never really been proven to be necessary supplements that you can see this is for naveen this is in their promotional material so naveen has got um, their little sachets of supplements just for them based on their dna um uh, but of course other companies thrive they go for the blair demographics are so clearly looking for a, a different um, audience there. Then there's a, a company called Ubiome, which uh, um, taps into the huge amount of pseudoscience that surrounds the microbiome, which again is very exciting science, understanding something, you know, it, there, there's a lot of fantastic, exciting research going on re regarding the microbiome, but there's a lot of nonsense as well. And, you know, as a cardiologist, exploring the gut is I can't really think of anything I, I want to do um, less. But the, the founder of uh, Ubiome clearly hasn't learned any of the lessons from Theranos because he's doing the exact same pose as Elizabeth Holmes. So we clearly still have lessons to learn. So why is it so difficult to predict the future with DNA? We can now do these, these you know, whole genome um, testing for $100. Uh, but why are we not predicting the future? Well, Twin studies um, can uh, explain, but also animal studies. Um, you know, there are animals which are genetic clones. They are genetically identical. Um, uh, some of them are, are kind of uh, uh, creatures that you're not familiar with or things like crayfish. But uh, I didn't realize armadillos actually have identical quadruplets every time, which was, was quite interesting. So you can see from all of these kinds of studies where you've got two organisms which are genetically identical, but we all know that if they grow up in different environments, then they turn out biologically different. So that clearly is something more than just your, your germline DNA. And of course, you know, we all know what that is. It's the intangible variants, the non-shared environment, all the things that happen in your life that affect you. If uh, one of these two twins there grows up in a, a, a very affluent environment, another one in poverty, we know that they will um, turn out biologically different as adults, even though their DNA is identical, because of, you know, countless stochastic processes through their lives, um, you know, different things that uh, they're exposed to, um, which no computer, no uh, amount of data or processing power can ever account for. Then there's epigenetics, which um, you've uh, again probably heard of. If DNA is uh, your the text in in your kind of book, then 
Epigenetics is sometimes described as your Kindle e-reader. It's how the text is displayed, the font, the font punctuation, paragraphs, even what chapters are visible. So there's so much more that goes into this than just sa sampling someone's DNA and then making these predictions about their lives. Lee Hood, who is a sort of household name in genomics, um, and a, a, a very sort of pioneer in this field was a co-founder of a company called Arivale. And I don't want to pick, the, you know, there are many of these companies out there, but this in particular uh, was quite a high profile one in 2015, which offered for a few thousand dollars a year, all this kind of information coaching based on your genetic data. Um, and they promptly folded in 2019, very abruptly. And their CEO blamed people, said that, Americans are just not that interested in their health, which I don't think is true at all. I think people are very interested in their health. And then said that we were just 10 years too early. So again, this is that techno optimism that the promised land is coming. We were just too ahead of the game. Um, and then I'm sure many of you know um, uh, Professor George Davies Smith, uh, epidemiologist and who talks about sort of uh, precision medicine quite a bit um, in sort of more of a cynical way. And, and from him, I've, I've learned this this uh, interesting, um, amusing chronology. Francis Collins, um, who is the former head of the NIH and the current chair, I think still current, of President Biden's Scientific Advisory Committee, was speaking at Harvard in 1999, talking about, this is, remember, peak sort of human genome project excitement, talking about the 2010 when this, this genetic testing is going to be available to us. So he's imagining the future. And he gives a hypothetical situation of John, a 23-year-old man who's a heavy smoker, whose father died of a heart attack in his 40s, and who's got high cholesterol. And he has all this battery of genetic testing, which will be available in 2010. And he gets some really important information from this genetic testing that he's at higher risk of lung cancer and coronary artery disease, something that I could have never told a 23-year-old man who's a heavy smoker with raised cholesterol and an adverse family history of heart disease. I mean, truly, this is uh, in impressive stuff. And he has this teachable moment where he can make a lifelong behavioral change. So, okay, fine, maybe the information, I'm being a little bit facetious, but based on his genetic data, he was able to, to make a change. But the data doesn't suggest um, that this is what happens when we give people genetically guided information they don't really change their behavior in any kind of more meaningful way than just giving them the usual uh, advice so then in 2008 francis collins writes again now about 2020 and now there's even more advanced genetic testing instead of john it's now amy who is an asthmatic and is overweight and she has this genetic testing and is told to exercise and diet i mean you know, really, this is this is uh, groundbreaking stuff. The other kind of area I wanted to talk about was medical imaging, and this is a kind of particular interest of mine. Um, uh, and there's a growing trend of people scanning themselves. There are all the so many companies um, that offer scanning and to you know nip problems in the bud before they happen, which sounds great. I mean, what could I object to there? I'm a cardiologist, so people often ask me whether I would be interested in, you know, attempted to, to jump into my CT scanner uh, when, when uh, patients have gone home and scan my own coronary arteries because then you can pick up coronary disease, which of course is, is uh, a huge killer. Cardiovascular disease, the number one killer in the world. And I would say no, because I'm asymptomatic. So I don't, obviously if I'm getting central crushing chest pain when I'm exercising, that's a different story, but I'm feeling fine, thankfully. So why would I jump into a scanner? What's it going to tell me? If it shows a bit of narrowing in my coronary arteries, I know that I have to exercise and uh, eat healthily. If I see nothing in my coronary arteries, I know that I have to exercise and eat healthily. It doesn't change my behavior in any way. And we know that just looking for narrowing in the coronary arteries and putting a stent in not only doesn't help patients, it actually harms them. So trying to screen uh, asymptomatic people has got all kinds of pitfalls, but okay, that's coronary disease. What about cancer? And I see 
a tweet like this on a regular basis on online, some sort of tech focused guy, again, I don't want to pick on this specific person, but it's just a recent one, saying they've, they've had a full body scan and they recommend it to everyone. And there are 237 replies there. I would say about 236 are doctors saying this is a terrible idea. Why are they all saying this? And I'm going to have to go over this a little bit quickly uh, in the interest of time, but it's a complicated um, uh, field. But H. Gilbert Welch uh, has, has written quite a bit about this. And there are different types of cancer. Uh, the, the bird there, the fast growing cancer, unfortunately, is very aggressive and fast growing. And it's very unlikely any screening program is going to catch that. You've got the slow growing bears, which are the ones you want to try and target with screening. At the bottom, we've got time. So uh, the, y, uh, the x axis, you've got time and the size of cancer on the y axis as it grows. And then you've got screening in that dotted red line there. But there are cancers which grow very, very slowly or just stop occasionally, even reverse. Prostate cancer is a classic example in men that if you scan a lot of elderly men, you will find prostate cancer. But does that mean it's going to cause a problem? The thing is, we have no way of knowing at that dotted red line which of those cancers are going to kill the patient or which are just going to sit there and not cause a problem. And they will die with the cancer rather than from the cancer. And if you scan people, you will find bumps and blobs and shadows. And it's really difficult to know how to interpret that. And this is um, the, the inherent problem with the argument that data, just getting more data will, will solve problems. In fact, it creates problems. Now, there's nothing wrong with data. It's how we interpret it. We don't know. We can't predict the future about what these little findings that we all have in our bodies are going to do. And this can lead to what's called a cascade of care. You can find some little nodule. We don't know what it is. So you say, okay, you're going to have another scan in six months time. A healthy person has now become a patient. They may have anxiety from this. They have to go back for a repeat scan. Often this comes out of their own pocket. They may end up having a biopsy. They may even end up having surgery. And we have no way of knowing if they needed it. And this is Santorio Santori, a friend of Galileo's. 450 years ago, um, who perhaps was the, the first person to invent this trend, the quantified self, this just trying to get, gather as much data about the body as possible. This is a, a scales that he created. He sat on, he weighed everything that went in and out. He had uh, some lackeys to do that for him. And this trend has, has continued. And, you know, we have these people who are, um, measuring everything about themselves. And this is becoming easier and easier with those smart devices we have. And there's this belief that if we just gather as much of this data as possible, we can unlock all of these answers. So I think the reason I mentioned Santorio Santori is, is it's natural to try and um, to, to, to want to measure all these things. We just need to know how to interpret the data. There's a slight sort of negative dystopian angle to all of this that um, uh, AI is very dependent on the data you put in. So, uh, you know, we can introduce bias into algorithms uh, un unknowingly. So this has been demonstrated clearly with racial and sex based uh, bias that we can so essentially bad data in, bad data out into these algorithms. They're dependent on the data we put in. And Yuval Noah Harari, the, the author of things like Sapiens, talks about a different kind of hacking with the, the huge data sets we're offering, we've already seen how a lot of these companies treat our data and sell it. If we're giving now biometric data, imagine what private companies could do with that in a, in a negative way. We've seen in China um, that uh, they're already using genetic data um, for uh, to, to stratify people on ethnic bases. And people like Charles Murray, who um, published an infamous uh, uh, tome on scientific racism, um, the, the Bell Curve, people like him are, who are essentially eugenicists are embracing uh, this potential for using genetic technology to, to better the population, which you know is, is very, very sinister. But I don't want to end on that negative note. I want to say that you know, I, I've, I've talked about some of the uh, clashes in the mindsets between the kind of tech and medical world. But I think the key thing is that together there can be potential for huge, huge benefits. And if I had to leave you with a kind of closing message, 
I think when we direct tech at the right people, it can be very powerful. And I think we've become very focused on on healthy people, as in healthy people who are not patients. And I think we shouldn't over medicalize normal life, but patients, people who have health needs, people who have pre-existing problems is where technology can be really useful. So, you know, wearable technology, I, I just mentioned that I think there's a, a, a limited amount we can get in healthy people and what they can offer. But I think in the right pa patient population, people going home from hospital after surgery, cardiac rehabilitation programs, wearable technology has been shown to be really useful. In my own clinic, when patients have palpitations, so they have symptoms, they're not asymptomatic, then a smart watch can capture one of their episodes, which maybe our um, existing technology has missed. They can catch, record it on their watch, bring it in to show me. And you know that, that is a demonstration of how technology can help. So I think directed at the right people, and with the right guidance, technology and medicine can be fantastically uh, powerful together. And that's where all of you come in. Thanks very much. Rohin, that was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, even though you did point me to a very, very old version of myself. I was in the US when I was doing that. They did big hair in those days. So, um, I mean, this is a, it is a fascinating area and politicians are mesmerized by this kind of uh, science. Uh, but I was wondering whether you felt that sometimes what's happening, and we see it in almost every field, is that a hype is needed in order to get a particular field off the ground. And by the way, I should say that Rohin is on NHS Wi-Fi, which should strike terror into uh, the hearts of our elves <laughs> behind the scenes here. So if he disappears for a moment, you'll know what's happening. But I hope you'll still hear, be able to hear him talking. Yes, so th thanks very much. Um, uh, yes, I, I mean, it's, it's ironic, isn't it, talking about technology and, and I'm being let down by technology today. But um, I think I think that's that's very that's a very fair point that um, we, particularly in something like the NHS, where it is a bit of a monolith and it can be very hard to turn a battleship and, and sometimes a bit of hype to generate interest is, is required. And I guess like most things in life, it's all about trying to strike that balance. And probably what I'm sort of trying to highlight today is when the focus on the hype maybe gets a bit carried away um, mm. and we get a bit too caught up in it, rather than trying to concentrate on the immediate, you know, potential wins and and uh, sort of more realistic goals. And clearly, in a organization, in a sort of um, something like the NHS, where resources are limited, is is where hype can be particularly uh, dangerous. And and sometimes we can really invest a lot of time and and limited money and manpower, or person power into um, into things that maybe is where that where the hype is a bit too too much. So how can we do techno skepticism? I think we've just made up that phrase, but techno skepticism. How can we do it better so that we allow what is genuinely useful to come through, but actually are much more questioning and challenging about some of the claims that are made. I mean, I think it's it's like anything, really. In in in, uh, I guess we can look to you know the scientific method. It's all it's all it's got to be based on results. Like any kind of intervention, whether it's clinical, whether it's operational, um, you have to base your decisions on on robust outcome data. So it's it's well and good and very important, of course, to, to gather data. But you have to to act on it. You have to actually um, you know, the, the very exciting stuff is trying something new. And I, I think we're all guilty of that. I know I certainly am in my own profession. You know, it's, it's very exciting when there's something available that's that's new on the market. We talked about some forms of bias just now, but novelty bias is, is another one where we, we, we tend to, to be interested in new things and maybe less inclined to do the more boring legwork of gathering 
important data rather than just a scattergun approach, really concentrating on the outcomes we, we want to achieve and focusing our data collection on that, maybe going for a smaller subset and regularly, more frequently collecting data. And I think that, you know, we've, we've got to have a very high standard and, and only accept interventions, particularly ones that have the potential for, for harm. Um, with with a with a sound evidence base, and and I think that's that's a message universal to, to lots of fields. Um, so I, th I think that we're in danger of trying to reinvent the wheel when when the the, the tried and tested formula of evidence based intervention already exists. And I think we also need to be careful about our what what we measure, and that it needs to be the health service that sets the outcome measures rather than the companies that set the outcome measures. Totally, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that, that's a very important point. It has to be meaningful outcome measures. And uh, it also kind of makes me think of Goodhart's law, where I'm going to get the definition wrong now, but it's um, where the, the outcome target is measures becomes becomes the target and you know classic examples are things like the, the four hour wait in, in emergency departments um so we have to try and avoid that trap of of uh then gaming the system to, to meet the target and i think if we allow companies um to, to set the the outcome measures they're always going to do things that make them look favorable so yes i think that's a, a really important point uh, there's an interesting question here from Matthew Hill. Um, I'm interested in what skills and capabilities are needed in the NHS to be able to maximise the benefits and mitigate the risks around this whole area of work. And do we currently have them as a system? Uh, and what I see very frequently is that actually what is good is often not introduced into the NHS because there are multiple hurdles of re-re-evaluation in every single um, place in the NHS, rather than having you know, one set of evidence that sat satisfies everybody, everybody asks for more evidence, and it just slows adoption of technology, which is actually should have probably been adopted some time ago. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's, it's a really difficult, um, question. I think the NHS in particular has so many perhaps unique challenges in that it seems to have sometimes the worst of both worlds. You've got a huge potential, a huge organisation, and it's perhaps of interest to some people that a lot of these American companies really target the NHS because it is quite unparalleled in having a single system looking after an entire nation's health and, and, and sort of unrivaled data sets available, but we're all familiar with the complete splintering of, of how that operates in practice. And I think you're quite right, Vivian, in that instead of having a true top-down approach, it, it can become really devolved and then everybody starts trying to do different things. Um, and you know, in, in response to, to Matthew's question, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience today will be far more qualified to, to sort of uh, comment on, on this these kinds of topics, because my involvement in in you know proper sort of quality improvement is 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 more in a sort of local capacity. Um, but I think that a lot of the problems are common in that um, there is this uh, you know challenges within the NHS. For example, you know if if we're talking about something like adopting electronic health records, where I think the benefits are, are, are very clear. So what has prevented this occurring? You know, it's, it's just a multitude of problems. A trust I, I worked at was one of the first to adopt it. And apart from some teething problems, I thought it went very well. And then there was a, a sister trust, which was, you know, the entire intention was to, to harmonize the two hospitals as they kind of uh, forged closer ties. And in the end, the second hospital ended up taking a completely different um, electronic patient uh, records simply due to cost. So, you know, there was there was this additional factor. Everybody was trying to be on the same page and, and trying to aim in the same direction. And then we were shackled by this, this um, sort of Damocles that's always hanging over our head, which was that cost just uh, prevented the, the ideal system. So 
I don't think we have a, a robust overarching system. And, and, and often when it works well, it is down to um, a really motivated group of, of people. Some of the things, though, that big tech companies uh, do is, I mean, we shouldn't just, you know, throw it all over the wall and say it's all rubbish because, you know, clearly they've built successful businesses. And there are some things, I mean, for instance, one of the things I notice about tech companies is the way that they focus relentlessly on one particular thing, which, of course, is a luxury not afforded to people in the NHS. But is there anything that we can learn? What approaches do they use that actually we, we should be thinking about and perhaps adopting? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think there is lots to learn, and I, and I definitely don't want to, to give the impression that... Um, you know, it's entirely incompatible. Um, clearly, you know, data I talked about today, and, and they, they are sort of the, the, the definition of data-driven companies. Um, and so there clearly is a lot of potential to use data well. I, I think it's just getting that that sort of balance that is the, is the real challenge. I think innovation is something, of course, that, that we can learn from, from tech companies in Silicon Valley. I kind of mentioned the tendency of the NHS to, to often be a very, um, uh, the opposite of a kind of lean organization where things can change quickly. And when it's apparent that something is better, it can take, you know, it can take a generation for, for practice to change within the NHS. I think it is getting better just within, you know, the 14 years I've been working in the NHS, um, that we are seeing things adopted more quickly and we're seeing some practices being abandoned, which which are shown to be problematic in a, in a quicker ma fan, uh, fashion. I'm uh, mangling my words here. And I think another thing that um, Silicon Valley really does well that probably will ring true with, with plenty of people in the audience is I think they invest in talent a lot better um, than the NHS does. And, and I think that is one of their key strengths. They nurture talent, they develop it. And I think that's something that we really could learn from here. We, we have a lot of fantastically motivated people who end up getting frustrated in their attempts to try and um, uh, produce change and, and improve things. And unfortunately, we, we end up losing a lot of talent. So I think that's something that we could really learn from these companies. And um, there's a top question that I've got here from uh, Stephen Hibbs. And what he's saying is, have you seen, this may be a short question, short reply, have you seen any examples of clinicians or patients successfully rolling back harmful or unhelpful medical technology when it was already widely taken up? I think, I think so. Yeah, you know, I think I, there's reason to be optimistic there. I, I, th I think things are getting better. I think, um, uh, you know, we are, it's it's less of a wild west uh, situation, you know, particularly in in terms of things when we're talking about technology, sort of medical devices and and things like that. I think we are getting a bit better. Uh, I think the, the the safety checks are a bit more robust. Um, regulation is less stringent for devices than pharmaceuticals, I'd say. So there is still room for maneuver. But I think um, I, th I think I'd be cautiously optimistic that things are improving there. Um, and a quick response, because we're coming to the end of our time here. This comes from Patrick Birch, who's a GP. Technology may have been shown to work, but what also has to work, a uh, key point here, Patrick, is the combination of the technology with the patient and the clinician in context. What are your thoughts on this, particularly on inequalities created through these combinations? And I'm actually, while you're thinking about inequalities, for instance, that... Um, uh, pulse oximeters were not properly tested on uh, a variety of skin colours. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a, a really good question and touches on a, a wider point with all of the implementation of technology and particularly a lot of the AI and machine learning algorithms, it, bad data in, uh, bad outcomes out. And, you know, things like racial bias, uh, sex bias, if that's introduced into the data set, it, it will produce the exact outcome that you you predict. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's a, a comment there, sort of regarding smart devices, um, and 
this can, you know, apps a few years ago were, were promised to be the, the thing that would revolutionize healthcare. And of course, the majority of our patients are elderly and apps and smartwatches and smartphones isn't necessarily going to be the, the best thing. So completely agree that we have to be very mindful of who our patients are. And if we get a bit too focused on the Silicon Valley model, who tend to be aiming at young, healthy people, we can get a bit distracted. Um, however, there are examples of these devices being used with the, the kind of patient populations that we're more familiar with in useful ways. It just has to be implemented in an inclusive way. So thinking of my own field, um, a lot of the pacemaker uh, follow-up and, and uh, monitoring is now remote. It's all done via wireless networks. And if patients are um, helped to set this up, then they can benefit from those things, meaning that they they have to they, they can avoid coming into hospitals regularly. So 100%, we have to think about who our patients are in, while implementing this technology. It's all well and good for a, a 25-year-old um, to come and talk about something very uh, uh, technologically advanced. If it's going to completely disenfranchise our patients, it's, it's not going to be useful. Uh, Rohan Francis, uh, thank you so much for that and for a terrific uh, presentation. I have to finish with a comment from someone uh, who was told by a cardiac imaging specialist that uh, she was a vomit, which is a victim of medical imaging technology. And I will confess that when I was reporting on the first draft of the human genome uh, uh, project, uh, I did say and I was doing Tomorrow's World at the time, that within three to five years, this would revolutionise medicine. I now spend a role, a part of my time with Genomics England, ladies and gentlemen, it has taken over 20 years. But anyway, there we go. Thank you so much. And let's now move on to our next featured fellow. Thanks and very much. We have Crystal Warmoth. Um, Crystal is going to talk about changing models of care and relationships with care homes. Crystal, bring it on. <laughs> 